a session where we honor the winner of the ACM SIGCHI Lifetime Practice Award. This is one of ACM and SIGCHI's most important recognition honors that we give to people in our community who have contributed in the sense of uh, to uh, helping the practitioners, to creating things that people use every day, and influencing the products that we all uh, appreciate and uh, help, uh, uh, you know, hope our research will transition into. So we have two awards. This is uh, one of them. The other one's the Lifetime Research Award, and that uh, will be uh, presented on Thursday by Dan Olson. But uh, today's award uh, goes to Joy Monfort. Joy um, has most recently been a consultant and advisor to the Vice President of Product and User Experience at eBay. In 2010, she was the, visual, the Vice President of Digital User Experience and Design for Barnes & Noble, and she managed the Color Nook eBook experience. And in 2009, she was an Osher Fellow at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Through her long career in human-computer interaction, she has been an internationally recognized leader in the field. She's designed and led teams designing a wide variety of systems, including airplane cockpits, personal computers, e-commerce, consumer electronics, musical, musical instruments, and even toys. She was the vice president of user experience design at Yahoo and led the design innovations group doing data visualization there. Joy had her own design consultancy and before that was a senior project lead at Interval Research where she had a series of musical and ebook development projects. She headed the acclaimed Human Interface Group at Apple in the late 80s and 90s and began her career as designer at Honeywell and a product leader for visual metaphors in the Interface Research Group at Microelectronics Computer Consortium, MCC, which was here in Austin. Joy presented widely and assembled, presented widely, and she also assembled the team who wrote the media-rich chapters in the seminal book, The Art of Human-Computer Interface Design. She's on various boards across the design and interaction community, including as an elected board member of the International Design Conference in Aspen, and she's been an invited plenary speaker across the industry, including the plenary speaker at CHI 94. Her focus areas have been interdisciplinary team management, data visualization, innovation, and advising corporations on the place of design as a source of value and of delight. The International Design Exposition, which she created and continues to lead with various corporate sponsors, has touched the lives of thousands of students for more than 20 years and has created an amazing legacy that has helped grow the next generation of interdisciplinary graduates in design. It's uh, my great pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Joy Monfort as our Lifetime Practice Award winner for 2012 and also give her this check, um, which um, is of uh, unknown amount, <laughs> sealed, so I can't tell. And her talk is entitled Innovation When Early Is Too Early. Thank you. Um, when I listen to the summary of my life, it does seem like a lifetime achievement award because when I got the email from Brad, I, I started crying because I thought, is it over? Is that it? My life is finished, you know? But um, I understand why we call it a lifetime, right? Um, and just a couple of days after that, I went to the grocery store and I see that we've got into hair products now. So I was pretty excited to see this particular product. Uh, I'm going to read it because I don't know how you say it. Katia Ton, hydration um, interlink, which I cannot believe is a hair product, but apparently it is. So I was excited about that. Um, a few years ago, which I believe was 86, I gave a plenary which um, involved a very complicated set of equipment that I was wearing, including a neck brace, having had surgery, and I also showed some scenarios, drawings, of how I thought the future was going to be. I had hoped to give a talk about the difference between now and when I gave that talk. Unfortunately, they didn't keep a record of my talk. <laughs> so all I have left is these sketches, which I actually got out at eBay last year, which was interesting because they, people were saying, my God, that looks like the Apple store now. 
and I was working, of course, at Apple just at the time I gave that talk. But the idea was that I felt that they needed to be fashionable, um, sort of runway-like experiences where you could decide what you wanted to have and goes with what. Um, and also that they were customized, so you could actually go in there and put pieces of it together with an assistant, of course, who looks funky, and um, you can decide what you want. And, you know, you go into an Apple store, especially in New York, it's a wonderful experience. So I feel very much like that was really great that I figured 15 years before the time that that's where Apple was going to go. Of course, they didn't pay any attention to me. But anyway, huh? Oh, no, they didn't pay me either, <laughs> right? So I'm now at Akamai, and that's the largest company that no one's ever heard of in the internet space. Um, yeah, that's um, Mike, was it, back there? Um, and it's, uh, it carries most of the cloud computing uh, internet traffic for everybody around. Um, before that, in the last year, I was consulting doing Future of Shopping, and as Brad said, I was at Yahoo, and I was an OSHA fellow, etc. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I worked on that were relatively close to failure. But, and it's, a, it's an important thing, I think, to talk about failures, because life's not just full of successes. And when you come to give talks and papers, people always talk about the positive. They never explain what went wrong and why. I think you can only learn from bad, difficult things. So um, I wanted to honor a few people, I think, who have been very, very underappreciated, maybe, in our world. And that's probably people you've heard of, like Ivan Sutherland, whose sketch pad is still, I think, um, something we're trying to attain. We still haven't got there. Um, and then the other people are my mentors, Frank and Ollie, who were two of the nine old men of Disney who um, were, created all those wonderful scenes like the spaghetti scene in Lady and the Tramp um, and other such memorable things. So I spent many, many years with Frank, who's on the left, and um, he taught me how to see, I think. And this is where I moved from doing um, what I call psychology or cognitive work into being much more practical. So I'm going to show you kind of a video that he presented at a conference I ran and then show you how it affected an animation. Audio. Now see, that guy made it pretty well. <laughs> this guy looks like he has a gimpy leg. Now, if I'd put that in a cartoon, no one would have believed it. <laughs> See, no one criticizes him. Good landing, huh? I would have stayed up for six days. <laughs> um, so the point of this is to, when I teach user studies, is for people to be aware of looking, not talking, is sometimes very important. And you should be able to carry those observations forward to whatever your field of specialty is. This directly impacted the rescuers. Speaking. Welcome aboard, folks. Fasten your seat belts. No smoking. Just. Sit back and leave the driving to me. <laughs> Miss Bianca, be sure it's fastened good and tight. I can't. It'll wrinkle my dress. And here we go! <laughs> directly 
sort of paralleled a lot of these things that Albatross was doing directly into um, the cartoon. The book that I ask all interface people to read is um, The Illusion of Life. There's one chapter in it which shows you how we started to use these a lot at Apple where we were slowing down before we went forward and all those kind of very simple tricks that animators know. The other thing is the power of the audio. Without the audio, it doesn't carry you through as an experience. And that helped me understand how important audio was just with visual. So this was after a career of having done things like thermostat design. And this is a Dreyfus design, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which took Honeywell about eight years to adopt. And I always tell that story to students because people think it just instantly happens, just your idea and it's out. And it doesn't because the traditional view was thermostats went that way, not that way. So it took the engineers a while to accept this new design. Um, then I went into space, as it were, and this, if you thought the thermostat was hard, then try the space shuttle, where you've got a bazillion knobs, buttons, dials, displays, everything. And I always said, though, that it's a good way of just learning design, because when you do aircraft design, particularly, you know you succeed because the pilot comes home alive. And the problem with a lot of consumer electronics is it's not clear sometimes if you're succeeding. So I think this is good training ground for people. We then, when I was at Apple, started to do what I call the beginnings of QuickTime. And here we had um, people from directly from NYU, from where Margaret went to school, um, doing what they called a composite document, which meant instead of it just being a spreadsheet or text, you'd put pictures in it. Now, nobody at Apple thought that was a good idea. You know, why would you want to look at something that was so small and video that was that big? Postage stamp. But until we prototyped it in a way it was actually with um, video works, um, they had no idea that you'd want pictures inside and that those pictures might actually be movies, not just images. So if you saw a picture in those days, you didn't know you could click on it. So we had to have a controller that said, hey, that's not just an image, it's a movie. So you had to click on it. This is Simple Player. And it took about 18 months to design. And all the people were actually in my group. There's a story in Bill Modridge's Designing Interactions book about this. But one of the things that was very frustrating for me was that the guys who did the prototype were from film school. Um, and they wanted to keep adding these um, lockdown, grab and move controls, which were typical of the film industry. And they kept putting them in, and I kept taking them out. We tested it, and all the people who were not film people said, well, where did the hand come from? I don't want to see a hand on its own cut off. And it was a very interesting moment where we realized we had to have less functionality in order for it to be accepted in as a general controller for Apple. We then went on and did lots and lots of other things we thought would be useful. This was the beginning of one called the video logger, because in those days we used laser disks, and there were hundreds of thousands of frames, I think. And you know, how were we ever going to find anything? Mostly, you remember things that happened before something or after. So the question was, could we take the 50,000 frames and chop them down? So this is one every nearly one uh, 10,000. And then within that, there's a little magnifier, which then blows up another one every 1,000. And successively, in a matter of a few seconds, you go through 50,000 frames and you can find the one you want. But nobody who didn't use a video disc had any idea you'd want to be able to navigate quickly through all these images because we didn't use images in that way in those days. So very successively, you could get somewhere. So for the 10 people that it was good for, it was a success, but it wasn't something we thought we needed because, of course, we still threw away most of the images that we shot. This is probably a never-before-seen image of a handheld audio device, which was actually called Walkabout, that recorded um, basically just like Siri. You could talk into it. Um, I can't remember if it just, I didn't think it played synthesis back, but it kept records of what you were saying. And um, people again said, well, you know, why would you want to talk to a computer as well as see pictures as well as listen to it? Um, and then if I hadn't had the NYU people there, I don't think anyone would have believed me because I came from aerospace, so that didn't count. This has been part of a very interesting um, lawsuit um, with various companies who remain nameless that myself and my team are still fighting uh, 20 years after we did it. This is the quick take camera. I've heard that someone bought one on eBay recently. 
and it was just exactly as you see, a camera with a screen on it, gosh. And right next to you is Don Norman, on the left-hand side, by the way, sitting in the front row. And what furthermore you could do was um, touch on the screen, pull out um, what I call um, post-its, stick them on things that you wanted to label either person, event, family, friend. I think that's the product we have now called iLife. So um, that's why these patterns have become very useful. And no one at Apple knew that we had done this work until other companies started trying to sue Apple. And then we had to get all the work out, which is why I have them at my fingertips now. So here you are. You see a finger being used on the screen. It's not animated, of course, unfortunately. But these are the types of um, labels you can have. You know, money, a note, a person, a computer. Um, you just pull it on either with a pen or with a pencil. I mean, no, sorry, stylus. You could also write on it. And it was, I mean, they didn't, this was running completely, again, with video works or whatever the updated version was at that time. It was pre-director, I believe. Um, and people were blown away at WDC, which is where this was all sh filmed. But what was wrong? In my opinion, which is probably not all of the story, but in a way it did too much. It wasn't just a camera. And it was all these other editing tools. It also let you write and it let you do things that you hadn't ever thought of doing all in one place, certainly with the content. The other thing was it wasn't very attractive because we couldn't get it any smaller and it was kind of clunky. Um, and also that the amount of images that we could store was relatively small relative to now and therefore people couldn't understand what was the need. There could only be really a need if it was cheaper and lighter and smaller. But as you've noticed, these things are now become professionally motivated back then and now becoming what we use every day. So um, we've also, I did some testing for Siri um, a few years ago before Siri came out. And um, an interesting story was that when I was testing the very early system, which is very hard to do in speech recognition because it doesn't really work, let's face it. So you're having to fake it a bit. Um, the person I was testing said, tell my husband I'm going to, to be late. And the, computer, the Siri system answered, right, I'll tell your, your husband you're ov going to ovulate. <laughs> and then they put this in the ad. Here's the traffic. Text my wife, I'm gonna be 30 minutes late. Is it going to be chilly in San Francisco this weekend? So he said, tell my husband, uh, wife I'm going to be late. So presumably they realized he wasn't gonna ovulate. But anyway, it was very funny. Um, what to, uh, in, to me what innovation means is that you have to really work with the next generation because we're really kind of forget the fact that we have the ways of thinking that are just old fashioned, all right? So the, one of the reasons I now keep running the Design Expo is so that I get exposed to people who are, let's say, under 30, and they really have some incredibly bizarre ideas, some of which I'll show you, but they break the mold and they move us forward in unspecified ways, which is incredibly useful. Um, in particular with the audio, I think the interesting thing is I always used to think with the half a dozen people I saw initially using voice, are those people mad? You know, because you hear them just, you know, well, I think this, you know, that themselves in the grocery store or in a dress store, and they're actually talking on their phone. It has now become completely acceptable to talk to yourself in any situation and have anyone else listen, which I find really quite odd. Younger people don't feel that way. Um, the other thing is it has to be cool, and I think Apple did the greatest thing by making these devices that people think of as status symbols, and they want to show off the cover that they have versus someone else. And also that they're very individualized. I have a different cover, cover from you, and we're all in you know, some sort of cool Apple club, you know, and they are almost a cult now, in my opinion. I obviously don't work there, so now. Um, I then moved a lot into audio after this because it felt like it was um, underrepresented. Like we were always talking about audio visual, like these guys here, and the audio is almost non-existent. Not, of course, the professionals we have, 
but usually if you go to a, give a presentation, you'll find that the audio is often very challenging and the video is actually better. So um, that's why I felt like I needed to represent the under, under belly of the world there. It's also language independent. People like music, they don't need it translated. It's also very physical, you, you know, bending guitars, you know, how many men play guitar and like to move around on stage. And also it turns out when I got into it, 70% of you all think that you're actually musicians, which is great. Not saying you're not, but it is interesting that so many people say that relative to how many artists they would say they were. So I think it's, although you could argue music's part of art, okay. So I designed a series of instruments um, with a very extensive team of people, included Thomas Dolby and Michael Brook, etc. Uh, this was one of them that was actually, quote, Thomas's instrument, where you put, you um, dragged spheres onto the world, which of course kept spinning, and different sounds were triggered when a clock went by. Um, unfortunately, I tried to get this one running, but of course it's running on system eight, I think it is, and nothing works backwards anymore. So we couldn't get that running, and we of course didn't have the right videotape, but we did get a, a videotape of the percussion instrument, which is this, that will give you an idea of how this one works. Techno piece took the percussion instrument to the limits of its speed. It was interesting to see just how different the same instrument could sound. Yeah, I don't read music, I'm a drummer. If I read music, then I would kind of have more of an idea. I would say, okay, this is going to be a piece you know, in this key, whatever. But I just sit down and wh whatever I start with, that's, that's a building up to, to go on from there. And hopefully, people with a sound blaster card will be able to do the same sort of thing. You know? So it's cheap technology, but that allows you to make high quality music. That's what I'm hoping. So that was uh, actually Thomas Dolby's drummer, that different sound samples could be used so it didn't always sound like a, I don't know what that kind of music would be. What would it be? Techno, I guess, right? I can't remember now, such a long time ago. Um, lifetime, right? <laughs> uh, this was the next direction I took with music. I thought, well, that's kind of not very tactile, Joy. You know, people are doing this, you know, on a screen, and David Liddell used to say, well, you sit there and you go mouse, 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 you know. And I thought, well, yeah, he's right. So I decided we'd use little bits of beads. I don't know why, but I got this into my head, so we started working with beads now. And you plug them into holes. I'm gonna demonstrate to you what we call the music box, and it's a, config a configurable music box. The idea behind it is you have beads, and each bead has an associated sound with it. As you plug the bead into the grid, um, you'll notice a change of variance. The variance up and down is volume, low, low volume being down here, high volume up here, and pitch is mapped low pitch over here, high pitch over here. So what I'll do is I'll actually take beads, set them into the grid, and you'll hear the resulting action. So I'll take a blue bead, go ahead and plug it in. I know you. You'll hear an associated sound with it. The sound will repeat until that bead is pulled out. If I move the bead to the right, the pitch is higher. So I can move the beads up and down, causing a resulting effect. I can add as many beads as I want, up to eight right now. So I can continue to put beads in. You'll hear the resulting sound there. I'll go ahead and put all the three uh, the next three beads in there, and you'll see the, the result that it all makes together. An onion? Garlic. Mixture of meat? 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 So the, you saw the beads were individually wrapped with um, individual ID tags so that the electronics inside the little box was reading whether the hole was plugged or not. And in terms of that particular sound samples, that was a grandmother speaking a Yiddish recipe. But because we were changing the pitch and the um, fullness of the sound, uh, it sounds almost like music. Yes, there was an organ on the bottom, okay. But basically we were doing things with very, very small samples of sounds and it is incredible how much great music you can get out of seven you know, sounds just by moving pitch up and down. And of course the piano has 
finite number of keys, so why not? You can get infinite combinations, but people don't often understand that. This was another variation of it, which I won't explain, but it was um, uh, taken over by the musicians in my team who thought we needed more controls, really a lot more controls, which led to it being way too complicated for anyone to understand, even the non-musicians. So anyway, I won't tell you that part of the story, except we got back to um, the design of the bead box, and this is the finished design. The beads here are translucent, so when the sound goes off, it has a nice glow, and when you close the lid, it would stop. When you'd open it, it would still be glowing. It was one of the most beautiful you know, things that I've ever been part of, and it tested so well, I couldn't believe it. Every age group, every type of musical source material we used, which was entered through a CD, everyone loved it, and I thought, my ship's come home, I'm about to become rich and make a real product. And obviously, no, I'm not rich. <laughs> So, what went wrong? Um, the problem was everybody liked it, and that meant that you couldn't target it to any market. It was too broad. Um, and I know you can argue that um, clutz and people like that sell this kind of product. We weren't allowed to sort of work with those kind of people, so we were trying to do more of a big market play. So the other problem was that um, although it was cheap enough to make, at the time in history when we were going to make it, it was about $50 to buy, which was relatively affordable. Um, however, what they found out was that unless I could sell it, that you could, so you could play it through the box, through this um, plastic, by pushing you know, on the plastic, no one would ever buy a musical instrument, which meant I then had to design a kiosk where you could have the beads tethered, which destroyed the entire experience. It was no longer sensual or interesting. And the other problem was it had to be put at this height, which is where all toys are sold, because children reach for them and give them to their parents and say, buy it. So if I had known that, I would never have spent nearly two years of my life on that project. <laughs> but one hopes that these lessons carry forward into some other positive things. So the small good end of the story is I did actually then consult for Lego, and I also have from Mattel, and this is the musical instrument that came out, and it plays the worst sound you've probably ever heard. It's all beepy and boppy, because apparently children are deaf or something. But anyway, it does the same triggering thing where when it's plugged, it triggers an event. I also believe it's never been sold in America, but <laughs> it did sell in uh, Denmark and various other countries. So I can actually say I did something that was a musical product. There you are. I also, at the same time, started um, sponsoring art projects because we had a, a sponsor, Paul Allen, who was very interested in what was going to happen. And this piece, you may have seen, it was done in 1999, which is unbelievable to me that it was that long ago. But it's a wooden mirror, which, of course, when you first say it, sounds absurd. But what he did was take what is a high-quality source from a video camera, degrade it into pixels of wood that then were oriented by servo motors to represent the shadow of your body going across it. I'm just turning the audio off because it's really terrible. Um, the audio that you do hear, though, if it's not a loud show like this was, is this ticker tape sound like you'd get in English train stations where it goes and it's really very, very pleasant. So the camera's right in the middle, it picks up, you know, you're doing this. And it's not obviously high resolution, but I think it was the beginning of people starting to understand that low res had some value in the world. So I then started going, I'm going to do what I want to do and not do work for any big company and um, try and consult for people I thought had really big problems that needed interface. So the first one I worked on was the Internet Archive, which is down in San Francisco or up in San Francisco. I guess it's down now, right? And it's there in a church. So Brewster bought this church. And in the church, he has people just scanning every known book, not the same as the Google book project, by the way. And here they are in every language, all of the out-of-print books. And he came to me, which we've worked on and off for many years, and he said, you know, I've done the usual thing, Joy. I did all the heavy lifting, and I forgot that people need to use it. 
So I said, okay, well, we'll come in and look at it. And this was mostly, at this point in time, for librarians or museums, not so much for consumers. Um, and the, it was a bookscape that will enable you to browse for images. So we showed this at the American Library Association meeting, I forget what it was called. The librarians in the audience took big deep breaths of shock because they have all these books that are scanned, brilliantly like Brewster, and they have absolutely no idea what's inside any of them. So and they can't just flip through every page, they'll be there for the rest of their lives probably doing that. So they have to be, have a very nice smooth way of quickly going to you know, letters or authors or alphabet or dates and then zooming down. This is done with the scroll mouse. So the scroll mouse moves you in and out. Um, and this was again done in 2007, I think it was. Um, so they love it and they couldn't live without it. We also built one like this for normal photo browsing on your own desktop because anyone who's got a kid knows they take a thousand pictures of their kids, and they, or a million probably, actually every weekend, <laughs> and they can't find anything. So this was a very useful tool. Then I got into touch screen work, um, and this was just a few years ago. This is the London I don't know, tourist booth somewhere, and my son is using it, but it's a big multi, it's not multi-user, it's a big touch surface. All children touch computers now with their horrible greasy fingers. And in art shows, you have to put little labels on things saying, please touch, and other ones you don't touch. So it's quite interesting to watch the guards because they get like that about everybody putting their fingers all over them. So um, this took us to use the same content from Brewster and make what I call a touch book. And um, this was to be used on a multi-user, multi-touch surface. And it would be to take found work, like this is, I think, Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? Yeah. And take phrases or um, pictures out, cut out pieces, and make your own sort of collage -y thing as a web page or something like that. So um, it's a very compelling experience when you're actually doing it, and you can cut pieces out, because you connect with the data so quickly. And this is done in processing. It was real time. Um, and the nice gravity effects are the kind of things you can do in processing, which is a language, set of graphical routines built into Java. Very, very useful for prototyping. At that point, I met the dear Aaron Koblen, who I guess you were introduced to this morning through Johnny Cash project. But um, he did this project for his thesis, and I was looking for the next big challenge, and I suddenly realized that this is publicly available data. It's all of the airplanes flying across America in and out of your airspace. Um, and I find it one of the most seductive, beautiful things I've ever seen. And so I realized that data can be beautiful, not just useful. So it changes to color with different airlines. So I hired Aaron immediately. Um, and he always says this. It's very important for us to understand that narrative used to be our medium to sculpt. And now there's a whole bunch of data out there that is sitting around on all sorts of machines, including at Akamai, waiting to be used and shown in interesting ways, which will inform the population of what's really, quote, going on. So these are the three guys I worked with on a lot of these projects, Ben, Michael Chan, and Aaron. Um, and as I said, data can be useful, and it could be put all around you. So. I did started doing uh, big shows like this, which was a nightmare, but I learned a lot about how to project images really big. This was done at Yahoo, and when front is a multi-user touch table. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples that we built for the show, and some of which were used um, by the engineers, others not. This happens to be a movie of the front page, and it's good you can't read it, because it shows you which parts of the front page at Yahoo are visited and which ones are not. So of course the logic would be if they're not visited, why go to them? Uh, that logic doesn't work in business because that would mean entire departments get wiped out. You know? So you have to be very tactful, which I found out by doing this work, not to go in there and be heavy handed about removing certain things. And for those psychologists in the room, 
It's usually about seven plus or minus two layers of information that you can understand through everything. So the flower always has about that same number of pieces. This is one that we put up in the coffee area because at that time Yahoo Answers was very interesting um, and nobody really knew what, they, what it did. Um, this is a transcript on the left of teenage girls talking about something. I think it's piercings at night or something. And um, all we did was take out the most important, most used words and represent them by size and distance. Uh, it's a word cloud. They're now very, you know, old fashioned. Um, hopefully I'll get to a newer one that we did recently. But in any case, it showed people who had never looked at Yahoo Answers what people actually talked about or what they did. So we got some traction from that. Um, and I thought it was potentially a very good idea for bloggers. That's not spelled right, I know. Um, and blogging would be something I don't ever want to read, but I would like to read a little swirly cloud of it, maybe. And I think Nancy Pelosi used something like this when she was up for governor. Anyway, we, I think Aaron has a real flair for being able to do these projects and make the visuals always look interesting. Whatever it is, this is traffic report data coming into Yahoo, 911 calls that are answered and not answered which is quite interesting because the nots are just as important as the dids. Um, this is um, a tagging um, visualization. These were all done live with real people um, and we color coded this one for the label color, labels, uh, labels that people used in Delicious. These are four people left to right, tags going up and down. And if you look at the patterns of the people, the four people there, you see that some people are more similar and more different. Now, I personally never like to be around people who are like me. I like to be with people who are different. Some people like to be with people who are like them. So we saw this as a way of being able to bring communities together for people who wanted to find people like themselves. It turned out that year at Christmas, you could send in saliva swabs and get a his and her DNA kit so you could have that on your wall above the bed. Very trendy, right? So here's a multi-touch table that we had uh, loaned from Moto. And this was one of the most compelling um, visualizations we did. This is the tabletop. It's showing um, live Flickr feeds. And what you're seeing is people moving the world with their hands and then touching on countries. And people got a real shock from this because they suddenly found out that people in Africa were uploading more pictures to Flickr than America. Um, and we also found out that if America wasn't sort of in the middle, people didn't know which way to, to go and what was up. And so I paid my son to stand there and keep putting America in the middle in the end. So because of the fact you were touching, you felt some really immediate connection to this particular demonstration. Um, but, and it was live at the time people did it, so it was very interesting to see what the world was up to. We also did this for Mail, which was probably the longest, most arduous project I'd ever been involved with, because Yahoo, I think, still is the largest mail provider in the world, or maybe it's co-leading now, but it was then. The, and we collect all the data, but we only collect every, and could get numbers up to two hours every two hours an update. So we then did a replay like for a few hours later of what was going on across all of the IP addresses across the world. And the people that ran the um, data centers contacted me and said, but we didn't know that. And I remember saying, well, but you're in the data center. You mean you didn't know that? What do you mean you didn't know that? Of course you knew that. And what they hadn't realized was that the magnitude of the difference between the West Coast and the East Coast. It is just huge. Um, and the little bumps are when some things go wrong, not, not the two hour averagings, but the little real bumps. And the East Coast is just not nearly as big. And they had seen the number, but they'd missed the point. Because aggregate views show different things than detailed views. And many pieces of data that we look at don't sort of miss the whole point if you're not careful. And things can be lost if they're done in too much detail. So we did ham and spam, and I will never be able to show you spam. This was the last one of these projects we did for the New York Talk Exchange, which was every um, 
I peak crawl in the uh, Manhattan area, going in and out of Manhattan. And um, at the time we did it, it was the largest, fastest amount of data being shown live anywhere. It was put up at MoMA. We had a show, and we thought, again, we've made it. We've done what was so hard. And then we were told, you can't show it. And we said, well, why? You know, I thought that was the whole point. And they said, no, 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 you can only show it with a day delay. And we never could get good answers to that kind of thing. Notice we're using the same browser to zoom in to the data and out of the data with the scroll, bit, scroll wheel on the mouse. People are scared of real-time data because they don't know what it means. If you ever see 411 done in real-time data, you'd probably never get on a plane again. So we had um, a lot of data there, and it was very interesting. I'm going to do this one. So I was hopeful about this particular game. Some of you may have tried it. Um, particularly hopeful when I noticed um, my son taking to it. And it's a game about um, how you get to have your own, I guess, biology world, but you grow cells and they have to compete by dancing and various other things, but no violence. And very, very sadly, it was, um, what's that guy's name, Will? I'm gonna say Will Rogers, that's not who I mean. The guy that did The Sims. Um, Will Wright, <laughs> thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I know, she's got better memories. Lifetime, right. So um, it was disappointing because um, it just didn't take off. And um, I don't know why I put that piece in there. I've had difficulty with my computer, so I've been reconstructing these slides all day. Anyway, we did do a similar piece of visualization work at eBay. And what we did here was summarize people's uh, conversations, rather like the Yahoo Answers one. This was me interviewing executives. And what we did was in put on half of the paper, half of the screen, sorry, is um, executives, the lower half are uh, product managers. And when you look at these over time and over different people, you start seeing some interesting patterns that the executives really have a different view of the company than the actual product managers. So we did this because we just usually throw all those audio tapes away and they're never used again. And so I, I just thought, well, that's a real waste. So this was done from audio transcripts, transcribed, all of the filler words taken out, and then during the, from the vertical to the, from the top to the middle there, it's 45 minutes. So we sped it up and um, did the approximation of how big, how many times the words were done. So it's a much more difficult task than it looks, because if they're too big, they fill out the screen. If they're too small, you can't see them. So you have to really get it together in the right way. When I got to Akamai, this is the visual poster that greeted me. And I was intrigued that they had summarized their whole you know, 60 seconds of what goes on in Akamai into iconic um, images of the proportion, representative portion of the internet traffic and what it was doing and where it was going. They also had um, this up in the coffee area showing us how to use the dishwasher, which I just had to show you because you never forget at Akamai that you're working with mathematicians. Everything is extremely logical. <laughs> so I'm yet again in a place where, you know, uphill traffic, but it's really good fun. And they also have one of the biggest uh, data display centers probably in the world. It's called the NetNOC, which is a network operating center. And what you see on I guess it's your left and right, right? That's pretty nifty. Um, I didn't turn around before. Uh, is every second or so of all of the traffic that's going on around the world of all of our servers. You can zoom in on this one too, all the way down to the actual IPs and where they are. So you could diagnostically do anything that you might want to do. I don't know yet what we should do, and that's why they hired me. So that's my current challenge. Um, did you set the clock for 60 minutes? Who, who set the clock? Can someone answer? It was, it was set for 70. 70. I thought, it was, I, thought I had 80. <laughs> Whatever. 
well, is it, if you say 80, you say 80, you know. Okay, so um, one of the things that we keep referring to as being one of my legacies is this project called the Design Expo, which I think was started in 87, but I could be wrong uh, because I keep trying to remember. Maybe you can remember, Eric. Um, and it was because no one was there to hire. So I said, well, gosh, I've got to fund some interdisciplinary design classes um, and then give them some recognition and give them a topic and hopefully they work hard. First few years were a bit strange, but um, it came through into some stability after that. The, the topics I chose, I think, are still incredibly valuable. So here we have 22 years ago me saying design a family of computers that work together, which uh, we still don't really have, but I'm, I'm looking, you know, it's getting better. And also one that said computers that make you laugh. I still, I don't usually laugh except sadly at my computer when it's not doing what I want it to do and I'm feeling like a moron. Uh, a really truly personal assistant, yes we have Siri, so that's clearly finished now, we'll never have to go back. Anyway, um, and why again, we want some feel. I'm so tired of talking about look and feel and there's no feel in any of the computers I know of really. Okay, I can scrape across the trackpad, okay. And they're all bloody square or rectangular. Bloody is not such a bad word in England. This was the first graphic ever done for it, not by me, by Jeff Tykes, who runs Nectarine in California. That was tw 23 years ago, which I just thought was so prescient because when we had it out the first year, people sort of went, well, that's really stupid, isn't it? You know, like a computer's gonna be that big and we're gonna hold it, you know? And yeah. So sometimes they're just, people are not right on. So this is one of the projects, I'm gonna show you a series of them. This is one done by a lady called Kate Richards who came from sculpture school. She made an igloo and you got into the igloo and this is what you did inside. I hope we can have some audio. As you move your hands to the grass, you control video, audio, and a moving sculpture, so. <laughs> it didn't sound like that. <coughs> so, done with um, micro um, filament uh, force sensors, literally grown into grass. And then, when you went like this with your hands over the grass, the ones that had those little fibers picked up left and right, you could not feel the microfibers at all. Deaf, uh, sorry, a blind person at uh, Yahoo was blown away from it, and every time he heard my voice, he said, that's the grass lady. And for him, feeling across the grass was just stunning. And these are real flowers, there's no fake. And they were on a, a desk, rather like that one there, with the big tall thing. And I had to stand with it because the artist, or the so-called artist student, wouldn't allow me to put a label on it. So if you come up to the flowers and lean over them, they've told you stories. So imagine how it was to tell your boss, just listen to the flower, it tells you a story. You know, It's very, very hard to get people to do things that break all of those affordances. You don't listen to flowers or talk to flowers. But this was a wonderful example of taking all the rules with, they had little speakers in them that were, of course, magnified through the um, trumpet part of the flower to tell the story. This was what, one of the hardest ones I had to sell. So this woman, again a sculpture student, learnt Max the programming language, which is not trivial to learn, um, to control light sensors that were cooked into the lollipops. So that as you licked them, more light came into the lollipop, and then you might well ask, well, what did that do? And then it controlled the... Also control computers and machines. You crawled around, going forward and back, and you won or lost a race with the babies. So I have some of the most compromising video of um, particularly Larry Tesla, if he's here. I won't show anyone that video. And other people 
um, when they were at Yahoo. This is a fruit bowl made in, by Delft that um, communicates between mother and son's apartments. It shakes when the son comes home through the internet. It's what I'd call um, low touch uh, communication, so nobody needs to see each other or hear each other. Great idea with mothers. Um, audio aid for the blind. I hope you're picking up that almost none of these have been rectilinear so far. I didn't pick them out for that reason, but it's an interesting trend that young people don't think in boxes as much as we do. Um, things that you want to hold and also things that you want to gesture across. Uh, these, this is CMU project. Um, this is CCA again. But there's a nice interesting mix of real world language mixed with computer technology as an enhancement. This is one I did this year. And here we've taken the um, connect, or they've taken a connect and using it in 3D with a soft surface that's just a um, rubbery sheet and they're just pushing down, going through different layers of a toy world. It was a complete pain in the neck to get this through customs and into California, but we did it and resawed it uh, in that shape. It was a, called Smirky Plop, which uh, was a big hint that they should change that title because it didn't really captivate me, but they wouldn't do that because they're students, right? <laughs> So I've noticed over the years, the interfaces have got bigger and smaller, and a lot rounder, and a lot more tactile, and a lot more sensual. And those are the lessons that we probably need to take away from this. Um, and they've also, these students are empowered now to build their own experiences from beginning to end. So they're not handing off to engineers, or guys with saws, or guy, guys doing electronics. They're actually doing it all themselves, which means a much more compelling future. One of the projects that came out of the expo was one called um, Sheep Farm. And this was one using crowdsourcing, which again nearly cost me my career at that point. And it was a task put up on the Mechanical Turk, run by Amazon, to draw a sheep facing left. And you probably remember, some of you remember the Mechanical Turk, not from the 1800s, but you know, the history. And here's the actual interface to the Amazon Turk, and we gave lots of talks about it, and these are examples of the sheep being drawn. Aaron um, did this for the expo, he was the winner that year, and he also recorded everybody's drawn sheep, and then published sheets of sheep to the population at large, um, and they could buy them. So you got two cents per sheep. Um, and my CTO at the time said, but why do we care? You know, of course, that's always what I answer every year. Why do we care about sheep joy? And I said, we don't care about sheep, but what we care about is people getting together in new ways, crowd ways, and also anonymously. Nobody had actual credit for these things, but they, we got with 10,000 sheep within 40 days and 40 nights, which was ridiculous, right? Now, yes, it is a stupid task, but nevertheless, you could use it for other things and do more interesting things, which many companies have done recently. So it's important that you have a manager like me who comes up with great stories for all those bosses that have to be told why they need to do these projects. Um, so just to note that people, some of people took this really seriously, 46 minutes to draw a sheep. I don't know how long it would take you, but. Um, you heard some about this project that Aaron did recently called Johnny Cash. I was told by Margaret that there were so many tweets about it that we should do some of it again and that you can never get enough Johnny Cash in Austin. So um, this was you know, one of the people I had hired who now runs a creative lab at Google. So um, this one was content that's been evolved to fill in a video that would never existed about Johnny Cash. I think you saw this part of some of it, right? I'm glad there's a guy actually responding in the audience. Thank you. Um, but what part she didn't talk to you about, apparently, was how these frames were selected. Well, that's what she told me. Maybe she did, I don't know. It's true, he says. This guy knows everything. <laughs> anyway, um, what you did was you could pick a frame. Um, you're given three. You could draw with black and white um, pen. I mean, not pen, but... Uh, an interface that allowed you to pick different pen widths and shades of gray. Um, and as you can see at the beginning, they're pretty blobby and not very Johnny Cashy. But as time goes on, people get it together. 
um, and they change their brushes and get down there. This is speeded up three times. Can you imagine how slow it is, really, when you see people do their frames? And then they'll, get po they'll pick one and they'll post it, okay? So you've got that. Then what happens is this interface on the bottom is a voting scheme. So you go inside and you pick, you know, frame eight or whatever it is, is better than frame two. And therefore the film is almost always unique every time you watch it because you're seeing the combination that the people with you have been showing. At that, I mean, want to see at that time. So it's always different. And it's, I just think, one of the most fabulously innovative ideas that you can come across. I don't know why it's so compelling. I'm not a Johnny Cash fan either. So you should give credit to all these guys, but they did an amazing job. And it then became so popular that people, you can put the sound on. It really allows this last recording of his to be a living, breathing memorial. I am honored to have inadvertently made a contribution to something so magical. For all of the frames to be drawn by a fan, each individual frame, it's got a very powerful feeling to it. Anyway, you can't really hear them, they're mumbling. But it's had about a quarter of a million people all around the world. That's the wonderful thing, is that they don't just stick in a community. And how they find these things and how they get involved, it's all typically, you know, but word of mouth. It's not that you get a newspaper or, you know, a quick you know, email from somebody. Well, you could get an email, but you don't know how they really start spreading. Um, I showed you that one. Um, as I said, there's a lot of new types of designers now who are also called programmers. So one of the hardest battles for me is talking to my so-called bosses saying he's a designer and they say, yes, but he programs. I said, yes, but designers can program and it's not one or the other. Um, and that's now almost, you know, you can't use that language. You have to be able to see these as a new breed of people. Um, and I think what we're challenged with now is figuring out, you know, what is actually real. If you've got those flowers that are talking to you and you have synthetic things like Obviously, we know these sorts of things are um, fake, but it becomes more and more difficult to actually know what will we be designing for to do what. And Burning Man, where these come from, is a really good example of a place where some of the most stunning, uh, clever ideas are coming from. Um, people are making DIY kits all over Maker Faire. This is for flowers that open up and with sunlight was done at NYU. One would think that only NYU was there doing these things, but there's 220 grads a year in a master's program. That's why they're good. This is another project by Aaron where the light, at, sorry, the glass in the airport in San Jose changes from opaque to um, clear, depending upon the weather, depending upon the wind and all that stuff. I think it's too esoteric personally because I don't know what it's controlling or who's controlling it or whether it's wind or light or what. But it's up and stored. Um, so far it's been up for two or three, two years, I think. And it's only had four pieces of glass go out. But this is another piece of work that you say, well, what do we do with these in the future? How are we gonna archive them? I don't know. It looks quite nice when, oh, that's, sorry, that's another one, that's not it. Now, being really up to date that I like to be, I don't know if anyone saw the two, Dupac um, hologram, who saw it? Was anyone at Coachella? You've got to stop going to Kai and go to Coachella. You know? So I didn't see it, but um, I got this off the web. So he's a rap star that died many years ago, and they produced a life-size hologram of his um, image. And when um, Snoop Dogg came on stage, he danced and sung with him. And the audience, who were really close, were just completely, as they say, gobsmacked, right? They just went, because they, of course, knew he was dead. There's no clear way that they're telling you why and how they do it. It's not as simple as it looks. It's a combination of mylar mixed with holographic graphic techniques from digital domain. So you might want to read about it, but I find it very interesting because they did actually cross across. I went to turn the audio out because it's 
a li little obscene. <laughs> but you can see he, they're doing, I think, Jimi Hendrix next. I think it was. But it's very realistic, and they move together and go apart. So I guess you have to uh, own every part of every action that you ever give now. I've done that one. And I still am amazed that these kind of signs are all around where I live. And my son said to me, Mommy, what is a psychic cleaner? And I remember thinking, he's, I don't know, why is he asking that? I've lived there 25 years, or 20 years, and I've never seen that sign. It's right opposite my street. So back to what Frank Thomas you know, taught me, actually look. And I frequently don't see what I'm looking at or read what I'm looking at. You know, they're everywhere. I love picking them up, you know. I worked at Barnes & Noble, and they had um, one in the bookstore that says arranged by letter alphabetically. And it takes some people a little longer to get that one, but it's like, gosh, even a book publisher can't think of the right things. So it's the end of all these different things, I think. Some of them are beautiful, some of them aren't, CDs. This is uh, Akamai, pigeonholes, as we call them in England. No pigeons, but paper. There's not one piece of paper in any of these, right? Maps, it's great. Rulers, when did you last use a ruler? You know, um, Bookshelves, my son has what you call the minimalist approach now. Money, you know, we're not gonna use that. And then what will we have? I don't know, but we've got inflatable Christmas trees. We've got, um, sponges that change color when we're in the bath. I don't know why. You've got pens that you can talk to and write on and store what you said when you wrote on it. This is my son's bedroom. Yeah, really exciting, right? <laughs> he has a white wall because he can project ITV on it and he doesn't want any posters on it, so they want the plainest, whitest, drabbest walls. Um, I frequently forget my computer now because it's too light. Um, and I think, oh my God, I've got the computer, you know, and it's a book, it's not the computer, which is kind of a big wake up call for me because my air book is too light. It's also, you know, here we have people, you know, how many people do you see looking at their iPhone, doing their hair? This woman's actually doing a live chat with her kids, but it, we look kind of daft when we do these things. How would, would you have believed me 15 years ago if I'd said that the iPhone would be used as a flashlight? or how to get into our house, you know, when you, with the key, you know, I do it all the time. And also, that is a picture of my handbag, because I can't see in my handbag at night, so I turn it on so I can see it. And then finally, we have a game that Mattel did, uh, using EKG recordings. This is not the Mattel game, this is another one. But if you've ever done one of these, you know, for the psychologists in the room, of course you know how you do them, but you literally sit down and you tell your kids, just move the ball, and they go, how? And you say, just sit still and do it. And it's fascinating, they do. And um, it's a game, I forgot what's it called? Um, can you read on there? Mindflex. It was sold for 20, no, $50, something like that. Two people playing basketball with that blue ring, air coming up, a ball, ball suspended in midair, and you control it and go up and down and score. No instructions, just put the sensor on, you'll figure it out. It's just amazing. I told Xerox Park that a couple of weeks ago, months ago, and they're like, oh, we're doing it with this really expensive technology. I said, yeah, you can get that now for $50. So they could not believe it. So that's all I have to say. And we have a few minutes left for questions. There's a microphone there, I believe. I'm on now. Okay, Nancy. <laughs> you said come on down. I do remember some of the design uh, competitions that were held at Town Hall and Apple. And I'm thinking of some of the things that were uh, game-like and, and, you know, baby toys or children's games and uh, we're very clever, and I always appreciated that uh, you spent the time with the students, but I think you should talk about how you prepared them, because <laughs> re the rehearsal part was something you didn't expect, as I recall. Well, um, 
I believe that time is the same in every country. And so when you say you have an eight minute presentation, that there actually will be an eight minute presentation. And when you say rehearse, they might actually rehearse. And you say don't go smaller than 36 point font or whatever it is. Nobody pays attention to any instructions that are given. So when they come, um, it's imperative, especially when I used to do it for Microsoft, that people actually stick to eight minutes because it ruins the executive schedules and everybody else. Um, and so in order to change them from what they give me, I've had anything from 48 slides to, you know, like, oh, I'll just wing it, you know, and everything. So then I realized I had to sort of, you know, keep them going and be very disciplined about everything. And um, they used to call it a baptism of fire. And most people thought I was the most horrible person in the world. Um, and then it turns out over the years, some of the people might be in the audience, um, they've become friends and they've become professors and they've said it's the greatest thing they ever had to do because their professors were not strong enough to stand up to them. And I was, you know, relatively hard on them. So they changed. And I've had people, you know, be nasty back. But it's been all worthwhile. And the reason for doing this is that when I interviewed for my first job at Honeywell, I was told by my boss, who I loved, that after I got there, that I was the worst presenter he'd ever heard. And I cried. <laughs> and then um, he offered me a job. And I said, no, I can't take the job because I'm the worst presenter you've ever known. And he said, yes, but you're eminently trainable. So I took it one step forward and said, well, I don't think students should have to learn that way. It's better to learn through someone like me than it is to be in a job interview and not know how to present. The current thing I'm having difficulty with is the students can't write a paragraph about their project. So I get pages or two sentences. You know, so I, I rewrite it now because and then they go, oh my God, that's what I did, yeah. You know, so it's been a really interesting learning experience. Over the years, you've seen a really different shape of what students, how students are coming up, um, out, you know, as it were. And I think the writing thing, I actually, at Acom, I now am gonna have writing. And it's um, pretty terrifying because there's not a lot of young people who can do it. It's mostly very senior, expert, precise people who really know a lot about word usage and words to qualify and stuff. And when you're writing error messages, and you need to be very succinct and very efficient with your word use. And you can't kind of write, you know, sort of. It has to be exactly. So I really appreciated learning from those people too. No one has anything else to say. John, you have to say something, don't you? <laughs> yes. So uh, you've given a couple examples, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you've given a few examples of um, artists uh, and designers and so forth uh, who have become programmers so that they can express themselves through that medium. Um, I've known many artists uh, who have no, what I would consider to be natural aptitude for programming using traditional programming languages. And I'm wondering whether you see advances in programming languages helping with that, or whether you think it's just bound to be a collaborative effort if those kinds of people are going to be able to use new media, or any thoughts on the matter? Well, I can tell you that the, the woman that did the lollipops and the woman that did the grass had no interest in learning how to program, not one bit, including the fact that when you were asking them how it worked, they never even alluded to the fact they were using a programming language. So I think it's more to do with how desperate you are to envisage your idea. Now, I, do I think it was a good use of their time? You know, I, 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 if I had been in charge of, they, they had individual projects, so you couldn't put them with other people. But yes, collaboration is very useful. And we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And I think that's another part of why I did the expo, because they usually work in teams. Those two projects, unfortunately, were, well, actually, the lollipop one was. But um, that was a man and a woman who did that together. But mostly, it, it should be motivated by um, complementary skills, I agree. Um, but I think, like I used to teach a class at Apple on how to use a Xerox machine for engineers, and because they said they couldn't draw. You know, and I'd say, OK, well, can you Xerox? Yes, we can. So we'd make them cut out pieces of paper and shapes and stick them on pieces of paper. And then they realized that it was just as simple as drawing a rectangle. And if you could, why I want them to draw and not do a graphic one 
is because I believe that the visual style that you use to communicate what you're doing should represent the maturity of your ideas. Because if it's a really sophisticated, and I've thought it all through, we should be at Photoshop and down at the shade of gray or yellow that we're using. That's not how it works in industry. Mostly they do Photoshop first, and all the executives are, argue about particularly orange. They don't like orange. I don't know why, but it happens in all sorts of industries. So then you say, well, just ignore the orange. No, I can't. I don't like the orange. So you go back, redo the Photoshop ones with different colors. But they cannot see the navigation problem or the labeling or anything if they don't like the color. So uh, we do some of our work and then go back and do it by hand so people then don't attach to the actual color scheme that you've used, which is just really crazy. But you can't ignore it. It's like music. You know, just ignore the music that you means you can't talk to the person next to you. You can't do that. You know, I think it, everyone should be able to do some things on their own and with others. Sorry. I'm in Shamaya Research. Congratulations. Um, I just had a simple question because I was out of town that day. Where can I find the racing lollipop babies now? <laughs> um, I don't know. You have to go and talk to the lady that did them. Um, I suspect it was very complicated, though, because, you know, you can't really lick things that other people have used, you know. So we only had, I think it was 100 or maybe 200 lollipops. And, you know, some of them broke and they didn't really work. And some were thicker than others. And, you know, it was one of those things that was big undertaking. Was it shown anywhere outside of the Yahoo campus that you know of? Or? Um, I don't think so. She probably showed it at her degree show. And now you're going to ask me her name, right? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> it's Erin something. Um, <laughs> yeah, Erin. Yeah. Everyone who works with me is called Erin, um, either with an E or an A. Um, so um, if you talk to Kate Richards, she would probably know where Erin went. And all you have to say is lo lollipop lady. You know. Yes, hi. Um, you mentioned the sort of beauty in data. Um, I have a friend who did his thesis on, on why mathematicians start their career, just <laughs> because it's one of the few professions that you actually have an intrinsic beauty. So there's some, some almost artistic merit to that. Um, but then you can apply the same things to design. And I'm just curious, if we just speak on mathematicians and designers, are we sort of growing apart, or are we converging? Or Because I spend time in both worlds. And I'm struggling with self-identity crisis sometimes. Yeah, I can see, yeah. <laughs> um, well, yes and no. They are growing together in some ways and not in others. I think what I've noticed a lot is that, um, that, that there are belief systems of both. So for example, one of my best friends is an electron microscope photographer who's done some, some amazing books, Felice Frankel. And biologists will turn around and say, that is not the right color. Well, it's an electron microscope. It doesn't have color. So, I mean, you know, you can't see what the colors are, da, da, da. And she says, well, I'm colorizing it so that people can understand the process behind it, which is what the math argument's about, too. And yet there are, quote, in people's minds, laws, like, you know, data is not pink. You know, I don't know what it is, but they, and it doesn't go like this. <laughs> You know, and you can make it do that, um, but I don't know. That what I think we haven't done enough of in this domain, actually, is have the psychologist, hello, do any tests to say, is this visualization idea better for this kind of data or this? Because there's all sorts of schemes, you know, pie charts, 3D ones, and zooming and flattening, and you name it. But we don't know, if you're trying to find something out about an earthquake or whatever, you need to get on this quickly. You don't need to sit there and have a lovely experience and like the colors that go whizzing by. So I think it's all to do with what are you trying to do with it. And we haven't done those evaluations a lot. We're still scraping at the surface. You know, we don't really get very deep. Yes, Eric, or do you want? So I, I, you know, I just wanted to add to, to Brad's introduction. Um, and, and I saw you cringing at the list of all the things you've accomplished. <laughs> <coughs> um, but I think, you know, the, the piece that's really worth acknowledging here at CHI, I mean, you sponsored my first CHI attendance 20 years ago in Was Monterey. It? God damn and, it. Um, what a mistake. You know, for the numbers <laughs> of us who have been touched 
and moved and inspired by, by, your, um, by your leadership in, in both the industry and in the academy and the bridging of those roles. Just in incredible and important for you have done that for us, so thank you. Well, thanks for recognizing that. Sometimes when I do sheet projects, I wonder whether I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, Eric. And thank you to you guys, too, for staying and listening. Thanks very much.